it's kind of a, a short-term pleasure versus a long-term pleasure. Your short-term pleasure is ordering those supplies or shopping and acquiring. It hits that dopamine pleasure center in your brain, but then you get a much longer, deeper, sustaining pleasure by actually creating with them because I'm enjoying using the stuff so much. Welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm your host, Danny Gregory, and I'm the author of a dozen or so books on art and creativity. And I'm a sketchbook artist, and I'm also the founder of Sketchbook School. In each episode of Art for All, I invite a friend to come and talk about things that matter to us. It's the sort of unhurried conversation that we just don't seem to get enough of these days. I hope you'll enjoy it with us. Today, I'm going to be talking to Lindsay Wyrick. Lindsay is an artist, and she's also a teacher, and she has an incredible YouTube channel called The Frugal Crafter. It's full of reviews and demonstrations and all kinds of cool stuff, and more than half a million subscribers tune in to learn more about using materials and painting and making beautiful things. She's also teaching at Sketchbook School. I learned so much from talking to Lindsay, especially about different art supplies and interesting creative ways to use them. She has loads of energy, and I hope you're going to enjoy our conversation. So I was thinking about a conversation that you and I had a couple months ago, and you introduced me to these gel gouache products because I was... Sort of saying, I, I like the idea of gouache a lot, but it's kind of, they're kind of expensive and they're also, you know, just, it's just fussy to set it up because you have to, you know, squeeze, fill your palate each time. And then if it dries up, it usually is unusable again. And you suggest that I get this set of, is it called Hemi? Hemi. Hemi. Gouache. And then later on, I saw that you had done a whole video about various forms of gouache, gel gouache, and, and the palettes. So I just want to thank you for that because I love them. And there's there's some minor limitations to them, but generally it just makes me paint a lot more. The form makes me point paint because they're right there. I think anytime you can remove the friction, like have your paints ready to go, you're going to paint more because you don't have so many obstacles or excuses getting between you and the paint. So I'm so glad that worked out for you because those are a lot of fun and it's kind of inspiring to open the lid and just see everything ready to go. No caps to undo, nothing, no palette to find. You just, well, grab a plate or something and you're re ready to go. I love it. Yeah. I mean, the colors I found, like yesterday I was painting, I had, I had done a blue background that I had dried and then I was painting, trying to paint these yellow dahlias and it took me a, a number of coats really to kind of build up enough of that light color on top of the dark, which I think probably wouldn't have happened if I'd been using like, you know, a design designer gouache that was more opaque. Have you had any kind of problems like that? Well, you probably were lifting up the color. It's probably not the color showing through. It's probably more the color putting on top, reactivating the color underneath. You might be right. So if you scrubbed it out or had a little sketch to begin with and only painted up to like your lines, and maybe just to let the white or your lighter color overlap it a little bit, you would only have any sort of like bleed through at the edges. But you can go in and scrub it off, especially if you have a robust paper, like a watercolor paper or something like that. Yeah, you're probably more disciplined and, and plan things out better than I do. I just tend to just sort of attack it and figure it out as I- <laughs> Not much of a planner, so I'd love to say that I was, but, but it just, I think probably coming from watercolor, is it's a little bit more intuitive to like, leaves some areas unpainted or even oils because you get so greasy and mucky once you have like a background of oils down you kind of unless you want to wait ages for things to dry you kind of do leave some parts of the canvas dry and bare so you're not just you know wasting paint and digging through and you know trying to get things to stand up on top of a greasy layer so i think everything kind of dovetails together and and one medium helps another medium yeah, I think that that's true. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I like about gouache is that I can continue to make these decisions. Whereas when I watercolor like you, you know, you have to leave yourself, you have to work, you know, your lights to darks have to happen in, certain, in a certain sequence. And with gouache, I like the idea of like, I can lay down my background and then I, can, I don't have to paint around the, the subject. I can, you know, know that it's all going to be back there, but 
now I'm learning a new lesson, which is reactivating the background is, is a problem. So you try lots and lots of different things. I mean, I, I think that you are you are a, a master or maybe at least a, a, a jack of all trades when it comes to art supplies. You have you try lots and lots of different things. You were just talking about ceramics, which you're getting back into. Talk a little bit about that problem. Well, it's kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen the play As You Like It, but like there's a character in the play. She's the mother of the uh, the family and and she's just very whimsical and she ended up being a playwright because someone delivered a typewriter to her house by mistake. And when I saw that part of the play, I was like, she is my spirit person. She is <laughs> exactly my personality because I, I definitely allow fate to kind of guide my interests. And I was reached out to by a company that made a bunch of, they called them sewing machines. They had different textile machines and whatnot. And one of the things they offered was actually a pottery wheel. And I haven't done that in like 20 years. And I thought, I would love to try one out. That sounds like fun. And so I actually brought in my the pots that I threw last weekend and just trimmed this week. Because I wanted to share them with my weekly, oh, I would hate to break them right, oh my gosh. <laughs> right before I film my <laughs> weekly sat chat on YouTube. But yeah, it was it was fun. It's so fun to learn something new. As a teacher, it reminds you what it's like to be a beginner. And it's amazing how skills you learn in the past can just like, you have the muscle memory. It just comes right back to you. And, and plus, throwing yourself into something completely new, it just, it exercises your brain in the most wonderful way. And it's just, it's, it's so good to grow and learn and do something new. It keeps you from getting burnt out. And I do art for a living, so it can be really easy to get burned out when you're doing the same level types of tutorials constantly and you don't have time for your own work. So to jump in and do something totally new that, you know, you, 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 at the, when you're a beginner at something, you just grow so much. Every like week you put in, you have a you level up and level up. You plateau once you start to master a type of media, and then you can get real burned out if you're not seeing the results. You feel like you're putting all this work in and you're not getting results. So trying something new can kind of help kind of break down some of those walls you're having in your other projects because you've got a whole new perspective and just you're exercising parts of your brain that just don't get tickled, I guess, when you're doing the same thing day after day. You're also restoring your confidence in your own abilities, right? Because you're saying, oh, I'm able to make progress over here. The fact that I've plateaued over here doesn't necessarily mean that I suck and I'm never going to get past it. In fact, you know, I can still do it. So yeah, that's an important message too. But I think the, the flip side of that is... You know, you are probably guilty of getting a lot of people to buy a lot of stuff because you show something and people, I mean, I've had that experience with you where I was like, I, uh, you know, you showed me something, I had to immediately order it and get it. And I'm sure that that happens a lot because you have a, a half a million people subscribing to your YouTube channel and they're all kind of coming in and saying, oh, I've got to try this new thing. I've got to try that new thing. The problem with that is people ending up with piles of art supplies they've never used, Right. Do you, do you, what do you think about that? For you know, that, I think that's definitely a legitimate criticism because, and I've, I've said many times, I'm like, I'm just going to change my YouTube name from the frugal crafter to the, you know, I don't know, something completely Extravagant different, crafter. the enabling crafter, <laughs> something different because, because I get excited about different products. I love reviewing products and trying different things, but, but I try to be extremely, I don't know if critical is the right word, but I try to look at a product from all sides and all angles and also say what it's similar to so that for all the people that buy something because they watched a, a video or a review, I think it also would prevent people from buying things if like something doesn't live up to the hype or like there's these crayons and these things right here. These suckers are so expensive and they're children's crayons and they are kind of like the mixed media darlings right now. They are, everybody's using them. Everybody wants what them. What brand is that? There is, I actually sharpened, I, I whittled one down just to see how much actual pigment is in here. This is how much pigment is in there. It's, it's short. So that's like the flat end from the um, from how like how much pigments in one of these and a set of 18 of these is like forty dollars there's I guess there's light fastness ratings on there but there's no it doesn't say what two stars mean or what are yeah, those Stadler what, what what brand is that these are the Stabilo, Stabilo. Woody three in one children's crayons they're for toddlers actually but they're fun to use in mixed media, but they're so expensive. But and they're really expensive because mixed media artists have adopted them. They didn't used to be so expensive, and it's I kind of feel like the kid in the Emperor's New Clothes. And it's like you can get Neo Color twos from Karen Dosh for cheaper than those. They're light fast, or at least they have accurate ratings available. And you can find all the colors you want, and, or just buy the few colors you do want instead of having to get a pack or buy overpriced open stock. I did take some heat from that. There were a lot of devotees to that product that did not like my video, which is fair, but 
I think that that video actually prevented a lot of people from kind of giving into the hype and going for that product when there are equivalent and more suitable to artists, quote, artists needs products out there. So, you know, I, I feel like for every, for every thing somebody might buy, cause they get excited about it in a video, there's something they're not buying. That's not going to suit their needs. I hope anyway. I mean, I don't know. It's, I get tempted. I get tempted when I see other people use fun things and I want to try it for myself. So I guess guilty is charged. I understand. <laughs> I, try, but... I, I, I mean, I think the thing about, about art making, particularly if you're not making it professionally, right? So if you're a professional illustrator, let's say, or you're exhibiting, you have that pressure from outside to, you know, to, to be making, to constantly be making or to continue on your path of making. Whereas if you're just doing it because you're, you're interested in it or because it's fun, it's also when you hit a wall, when you hit an obstacle, sometimes just trying something different breaks through the obstacle and keeps you going. So, so it is important to kind of continue to feed yourself. You can feed yourself with materials. You can also feed yourself with other forms of inspiration, looking at some, what some artist has done that, you know, that you their work kind of pushes you in a new direction. It could be taking a workshop. There's a lot of different things that you can do to just kind of push yourself past these obstacles when nobody else really cares whether you're doing it or not. So nobody else is going to help you or, or push you. You have to do it. You have to push yourself constantly. So, so do you think that, that we, by con by being dilettantes, we are losing the opportunity to get deep with a material. You know, a lot of times it seems like there, there are watercolorists who I work with and I'll see the stuff that they've done. And I realize like this person has been working at this particular skill with for 30 years, you know, with basically this set of colors and no wonder they're so good at it because they've gone deep. Whereas I tend to go broad, you know, and to just try it lots and lots of different things. Do you, do you struggle with that? Do you, do you, yeah, I think that's an excellent point right now because our attention spans are not getting any longer. And and I, I, feel, I do feel like YouTube, which is a platform where I have my greatest reach and where I spend a lot of time, I think that contributes to it. And I also think other other medias such as TikTok, where it's even shorter and all the like the Instagram reels and all those short format platforms, even YouTube is encouraging us to do shorts, which I really, I've done a few, but I don't feel there's much value in them for the work that I do. But I agree. I agree because I know that a video unboxing a box of art supplies will get more views on my channel, the channel called The Frugal Crafter, that will get more views than me teaching somebody how to draw something or how to paint something or a more advanced technique. So because you get that positive reinforcement and those of us that are using YouTube as a portion of our income, we're getting that reinforcement to review things, unbox things. I started adding unboxings up to the beginning of my in-depth reviews, just because I know that unboxing is going to pull in people that really aren't necessarily curious about painting with it. They just want to see it opened up. There's something, and there's some sort of joy that people get in that. Maybe it's like shopping without shopping or something. I don't know, but I added that to the beginning of my reviews to help them get a little more traction, but I still spend a couple of weeks using the products just to make sure I am giving people not just a Ooh, shiny thing, go buy it. It's a like, well, this doesn't, you know, it's good about this, but this is bad. And, you know, just so people have a well-rounded view of a product if they want it. But I'm sure a lot of people are just watching the unboxing and they're moving on to the next thing. So our, our modern society is definitely pushing us more to go broad than to go deep with anything. Because when I show up like a painting that I've done, like a painting I did before I got into YouTube, that's more in depth and took like you know, days to do, people will say, oh, can I have a tutorial for that? But they want a 10 minute tutorial for that. It's like, that took two weeks to paint. I can't, right. I can't break it down in 10 minutes in a way that somebody can understand it. So yeah, it's, I, I, I do think that we're being pushed into being more, more dilettantish, I guess, rather than being masters of our craft. It's a, it's a challenge because the stuff that we look at took people and the stuff that inspires us took people a long time to be able to make. And when we sit down to do that thinking, well, I've looked at their work or I've even looked at their tutorial. Um, the fact that I'm not able to do it must be an indication that there's something wrong with me that I, you know, that I lack talent, that I, that I could never get there instead of really understanding. No, it just takes, perseverance. It just takes practice. It just takes experimentation. It's not honestly the most 
the most common question I get when I draw is what kind of pen is that? And I always say, you know, it's not the pen. It's it's me. I did it. You know, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter really what kind of pen. And when I started to draw, I used like a uniball roller tip pen that I got from the office supply closet. And that's what I used for a year and a half because, you know, I just, I didn't have enough kind of confidence in my drawing ability to think that it was okay to waste money on art supplies. But I, but I think that it took me a long, long time to get to that point. And that's not what people want to hear. That's not what we want, but we have to understand that that is, that's by and large, the reason that we don't accomplish our creative dreams. It's not because of some failed birthright. It's because we're not kind of being encouraged to stick to things and to push past the obstacles and push past. And, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what gym you join if you don't go to it, right? It doesn't matter what kind of running shoes you buy if you don't wear them and go out and run. And uh, that's, that's a key part of it. And I, and I think a thing that I say to people a lot is it's not enough to sign up for a course. You know, you have to, and the fact is that the vast majority of people who do sign up for courses don't end up working the way all the way through it and then don't end up practicing that same thing again and again. You want to have fun. So I don't mean to be preachy, but that's why we're doing this. But it's also just go into it knowing what the limitation is you might be imposing on yourself, right? It's funny you mention that because I used to teach in person before I taught on YouTube. And I would teach children's classes and adult classes in my own studio downtown. And I used to do the classes all like drop in, like you come, you pay, you do your class and you leave. And I was noticing a problem with adult students and recidivism, like they weren't coming back. They'd they'd drop in or they'd sign up for a class. And then, you know, the class would get a little bit smaller every week. And so, but they would always make sure their children were to their children, their art classes. So they had the, the... They had the persistence to make sure their kids get there and they wouldn't let their kids quit the art classes, but they were having trouble themselves. So I switched my model to instead of charging by the week to charge by the series. So it's an eight week series. You're paying this amount, whether you come or not. And, and that really encouraged people to come back because they'd already got some skin in the game, you know, and they were paying that amount of money, whether they finished it or not. And I think in an in-person class, you're held a little more accountable than an online class because you're, you're in a room with your teacher. They can tell if you're skipping class, if you're not doing your work and uh, you got someone looking over your shoulder and you're also get to show off a little bit but to your teacher and your classmates when you come back each week. And I think that, is also kind of inspiring and that's something that's really difficult to recreate in like a self-paced class online but it's i also think it's wonderful that anybody can take a class from any instructor nowadays because of the you know the the online aspect but definitely has the pros and cons yeah i mean that's what we find with our program at sketchbook school is because it's live we record them but a lot of you know the point of it is to come to it live and to come to it week after week after week and you know to kind of go through the process and to also make appointments with yourself, put it down on your calendar. I'm going to go at nine o'clock, you know, on Wednesday, or I'm going to go at three o'clock on, on Friday, whatever it is, you have that commitment kind of there. So you have to kind of almost make a decision to not go as opposed to making a decision to go. And that, you know, I think that that helps because the more you do it, the better your results are going to be, the more pleasure you're going to get from it. So that perseverance certainly pays off. Yeah, obviously. Do you think that, I think there are times also that when you have the urge to make something, say you haven't, you haven't made something in a while, and then you have that urge to, to create, that a lot of times going to the art supply store can, can satisfy that urge. Like you go to the store, you look at all the stuff, you come out of it, you're sort of like, oh, I'm, I've got a bag full of stuff. You're not really necessarily like rushing home to go and use it. You just sort of like, and then you kind of come home and drop the bag in the corner. And then, you know, hopefully eventually you open it and start using it. But it's a kind of a funny thing how shopping can kind of satisfy that urge. Yeah, it hits that dopamine pleasure center in your brain. And it's it's kind of like, like a joke with my husband because he, he does woodworking and will do a lot of projects around the house and whatnot. And then sometimes he'll buy the materials and then he'll feel like he's done the project. Well, I got the materials, therefore I've done the project. And I feel that same way too if I like go and buy fabric to make something that's like, oh, I bought the materials so the project is done. You know, it almost feels like you've accomplished something just by acquiring it. It must be part of our lizard cave people brains that we think, oh, we've gathered the stuff, then we are all set. 
but it's it's yeah it's totally different it's a total different I, I think it's a kind of a, a short-term pleasure versus a long-term pleasure your short-term pleasure is ordering those supplies or shopping and acquiring but then you get a much longer deeper sustaining pleasure by actually creating with them when I'm feeling like I'm a little bit too much on the treadmill of of acquire, acquire, acquire. I do, I'm actually in a no spend month right now. I'll, I'll just cut myself off cold turkey for like a month or two months or whatever it is and, and just work with what I have. And I always feel so much better about myself and about my work because I'm not buying. I don't feel that guilt of I have to use it up. I'm actually like taking a breath and stopping the consumerism and then just enjoying what I have and enjoying using it. And then often I find that that no spend lasts like it really curbs my spending for another, you know, six or 12 months even because I'm enjoying using the stuff so much. So that's what I give as an advice for people that say they're, they're accumulating a lot of supplies and they're not using it or they do like a create to spend. So it's like, I used to do this when I, when my kids were little and I was doing a lot of scrapbooking, which really helps your collage ability and your composition ability. So anybody that poo poo's scrapbooking, it's practical. You're doing something with your photographs. You can look back at your progress and you feel accomplished because you've done something and you're going to get better at collage and and design by doing that so uh, but that's an aside but I would do like a like a scrap to spend challenge where I'd be like I'm going to do 10 layouts with what I have before I buy anything at the scrapbook store or before back then we'd go to like we'd all get together all the you know as a lot of moms would get together and a very welcoming group which is really what got me into it because I never scrapbooked I never looked at it as like I just had like visions of kind of fuddy-duddy things and, and albums you know nothing really that creative but then when I had kids I went to a scrapbook store and I mean you could do anything you could put anything in these books it was like you could do mixed media which is what I really like doing and it and it was a creative aspect that was very welcoming there was no hoity-toity you know you're not a real artist type you know attitudes or anything like that but I would do but I but it's very easy to be like oh I want to try that and I want to try that this is new I want to try all the things I would be like okay no you need to do 10 layouts with what you have before you buy another package of this or that and as you the first layout you might be grumbling like oh I gotta do this like it's like I gotta exercise you know it's not fun and then it gets then you get more creative and you start like seeing what possibilities like take clothing tags, for instance, use those for embellishments and, you know, use your art supplies for embellishments, do all of that. And then by the time you hit layout number 10, you're like, well, I really don't need anything from the scrap store. And so, you know, you ended up kind of being more creative because you had less. And I know the more supplies I bring to a either a scrapbooking crop or a craft night with friends or even to go out plein air painting, the more I bring, the less I do. Mm -hmm. If I have a tiny little kit of materials that will fit in my pocket, I will do, you know, five sketches. If I bring a whole bag full of stuff, I might get one done. So yeah. it's funny. It's funny how these limitations actually are good for our creativity. I was going to say the same thing. I think it's true in anything. It's like working with a limited palette or, you know, just deciding that you're going to work to a time limit, you know, so doing a drawing in two minutes and then doing a drawing of another thing, you know, drawing with your non-dominant hand, any, lots of kinds of things like that. They push you into solving new kinds of problems. If you have everything at your disposal, A, you're spending a lot of time figuring out which one should I use, but also B, you're not, you're not, you're not making something out of nothing or you're not, you know, you're not mixing colors because you have every color, you know, so all those kinds mm -hmm. of things make a big difference and stretch, stretch you in new direction. So that's really, that's really great as well. So you're going to be teaching a workshop for us, which is really going to be a lot of fun and talk a little bit about what that workshop is. It's a mixed media workshop. I actually have, can I show you the artwork? Well, is this that, is an, is this is a okay? podcast. So no. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really wouldn't work on radio. No, well, it is picture, about if you will. Um, <laughs> the theater of the mind. Exactly. So this, we're, we're going to paint desserts, actually. So it's kind of fun and bright and colorful just because of the subject matter. But what we're going to be doing is a mixed media technique. I am very, I like to jump in and, and get right to work. And I also like to, I kind of like some fast results. And one of the ways that I get fast results is starting with either watercolor and ink as my first layer, and then going over it with colored pencil. And you get the, you get the translucently, the the mushiness the 
blendability of watercolors or inks, and you get to cover the paper. You get to cover the grain of the paper. And then I also love colored pencil, but I don't love the hours and hours of work it takes if you want to get a smooth, rich color. So by starting with inks or watercolors, and I'll be using the Derwent Ink Tense Pan Paints. So they're not only are they are they like a watercolor and like an ink. If I do a layer and then I want to layer over it, it's not going to activate anything below. Kind of like alcohol markers or using like India ink, and then I can go over it. But I still haven't wrecked the tooth of the paper. I don't have like like I haven't sealed up the tooth of the paper, so I can go over with colored pencils. And I love to use a soft, creamy, opaque color pencil because it will stand up over the ink. If I want to shift a color or I want to highlight, I can do that with the opaque pencils. And just by stacking those media, you can get a very similar result to what would take several hours in just color pencil in like half an hour. It's it's a really fun technique. It's great if you just like to jump in with color and get your idea out there. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lively class. And I hope I hope anybody that's curious about that listening to the podcast will give it a try. Yeah, absolutely. It's called Yummy Color. And it's going to be on October 15th at 9 a.m. Pacific. And it's a it's a live workshop, but we call these workshops live-ish, which means that that you've recorded the demos in your studio and taken the time, and we've been able to edit them, we've been able to polish them and make them as clear as possible. But then you and I actually are going to be, or maybe somebody else is hosting, and I'm not sure. But anyway, you will be there to answer questions, to explain things that that maybe people didn't quite understand to make new suggestions. So it's to me the best of both worlds because you have the focus and clarity of a, of a demonstration that's been prepared in advance, plus the spontaneity and the responsiveness that you get from actually having the instructor there to talk to you. And of course it's all recorded and you have the recording forever. So you can kind of go back to it. I find that this, this workshop of yours will creating three separate pieces. And I love that you, kind of jump from one to the other to the other. So you, you're there. It's like you're playing You're it's, it's, I guess it's like cooking dinner where you're making you're the appetizers, the dessert and the, the entree all at the same time, except they're all dessert. So, but you just musical, musical paintings right. and <laughs> jump from one to the next to the next. Yeah. I like to work like that though. Cause watercolor can take a while to dry. So be, and then, and then if you do too much on a watercolor, you can overwork it. So that just automatically makes you stop and go to something else. So I love to have, a bunch of different products, uh, projects going at once just to keep me from overdoing one and give me a time to think, give my kind of, of a mental a switch between projects. So because uh, I come back to something and have a creative solution to something that was stumping me. So that's another thing you'll learn from the class on how to like kind of have a few things going at once. And yeah, I think what's yeah, great about a, it also is, teachable moment. Yeah, you're teaching also the same techniques in a way, using the same materials, but they're three different, really kind of different looking images and with different color ranges. And I think that that makes it also really different that, that, I mean, you're coming away with seeing how those techniques can have really pretty different results, which I think is great. If you get what Thanks. I mean. Thanks. Yeah. Textures are so important and being able to catch a, like a glossy, cho drippy chocolate versus a cakey, spongy texture or like a, a smooth glaze or, you know, yeah, it's, it's fun to get those textures. That's why I love to draw food because there's so many delicious textures there. It's a, it's a lot of fun. But I feel like the things that you're teaching, even if you don't want to draw desserts necessarily, these are all things that you could use for urban sketching. You could use it for portraiture. There's, there's lots of different applications for these techniques, which I think is, but, I, but the desserts just make it fun. So it's going to be, it's going to be great. Good. Well, that is going to be something to look forward to. People can sign up for it. Now we'll put information about where to sign up for it in the show notes and in the YouTube paraphernalia, whatever it is that goes below the, the YouTube video. Um, are there any cool new materials. I mean, last time you recommended this squash to me, what are there any things that you're particularly excited about and enjoying working with these days? Oh, oh my gosh. I've, I've, other than clay, 
I've been working with a pottery wheel and clay. That's been my excitement. And I really want to try this. I was looking at glazes because I don't have a kiln. I'm going to have to take it to a ceramic shop to have things fired. And I was looking into underglazes and I saw these underglazes made by Amico that are like watercolor pans. So I'm like, I could paint the glaze on from like a dry cake of color, like watercolor. That's, that's, I'm excited about that. I haven't tried it yet though, because I'm on a no spend, but but next month, man, <laughs> I think that's going to be first on my list to buy and try. That's I cool. did try, I actually did just buy the matte, some of those matte graphite pencils but but so i'm not going to say the brand because actually they're not i don't think they're for me i'm i'm well i'm kind of through well this is a podcast you can't see anyway but i'm like go i, I had to give up on a drawing last night I'm like i just need to take a break and come back tomorrow because i'm finding it they feel kind of sticky and gummy they don't feel smooth and i'm a very tactile person and i love i love smooth blendable smushable smudgeable things and they almost act like a waxy charcoal and well, I like Conte, but I'm kind of expecting a pencil and I'm not getting on with them, but there's something new that I really wanted to try and I'm trying them and they're not getting along with my, uh, my personality currently. So that's interesting. Cause so I, I, I guess those are the two new things that I've been working with. Cause I was going to, I say that I think a lot of times there you get an art supply and you think, well, how am I going to use this? And so that becomes kind of your starting point, right? Which is okay. Have this. You know, I just got a set of these Cotman metallic watercolors, and I was like, okay, well, what am I going to paint that's metallic, though? And I just I had to kind of stretch to think about that, and then eventually I found a few techniques, a few subject matters where it worked really, really well. So in that case, I've started with the material. But a lot of times, I think you also start with an idea, and then you have to, particularly if you have a lot of art supplies, you think, well, what are the, what's the medium that would be best to use for this? So it's kind of that, that balance, whether it's, one motivating the other, right? Do you, start, do you, yeah, do you have that? Yeah, totally. Because sometimes, I, you know, you want to, sometimes just feel like you're in a thick paint mood. Like you want to be cozy and you want to, you know, smear around thick paint and you want to be quiet and work in layers and go slow. And then other times you're feeling kind of frantic and you're restless and you just got to get something out and on paper because you just kind of feel like your skin's crawling and you got to, you know, you just got to throw it all out there and see what happens. You know, it's uh, like gel printing. I love gel printing because if you are just like in a mood where you got to get your, you just need something to encompass you and, and you got to get that energy out gel plates are great because you can just like print and print and print and print. And then you've got all this paper afterwards. And then what am I going to do with this? And you can tear and collage and do art with it or do cards with it or do scrapbooking with it. You could print on fabric. I mean, you can do, you can do anything. And I, I feel like I have to try and channel my energy to different things, depending on how my, my mood is for the day, because I definitely, I feel restless a lot. So I think that keeps me diving into a lot of different medias and switching back and forth between a lot of different medias. You have a lot of energy. That's clear. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think I I definitely gravitate. Like there are times where I'm want to work with a very fine point, fine liner, and do a lot of like net, kind of tight, you know, double O, triple O, cross hatching, that kind of thing. Then there are other times where I want to have big bold colors. I want to have large pieces of paper that I'm working on. I I want to splash. I want to have accidents happen. You know, there's just who you are and how you're feeling at certain times. You know, then you then you choose your media to go along with it. I find that there are times when I have less and less and less color in what I'm doing, and uh, then it's something I'm I'm just painting in sumi ink and I'm just doing tones, and then suddenly I need to erupt and go in a different direction. And and I'm, it's it's funny because I think a lot of times actually it's sort of the opposite of what my mood would be almost. Like in other words, when I'm feeling like everything is good, I'm moving to an atonal place. And when I find that I'm anxious and worried, I want bright colors. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, like if, at the beginning of the pandemic, just before that, I was totally just black and white. And then suddenly I needed gouache and I needed procreate on my iPad and I needed splashes of color. And that made me feel better. Strange. Oh yeah, it definitely can. Working with certain colors and certain medias can pull you out of a funk, can improve your mood, definitely. Good. So what are you going to be making today? Are you going to be making, throwing some more pots? Well, I've been doing my pottery in the weekend. I have to get my weekly sat chat video filmed, which is a it's just like a talking to the camera video I do every week. Actually, speaking of the pandemic, I started it during the beginning of the pandemic, kind of like a fireside chat, kind of like just to kind of touch base with my community. Like 
um, kind of cheer people up a little bit, get people inspired, get people's mind off the gloom and doom. And people really resonated with it and kept looking forward to it, saying, oh, I hope you keep doing these after the pandemic. And I've been doing them every Saturday ever since. And it's kind of fun because then people share about their lives in the comments. We have just like big conversations underneath the video in the comments section. And I've gotten to know so many people. They've gotten to know each other. You know, we're all asking a, a, after each other's families and it's just really nice. But I was working on this one. I know some of you will be watching this on YouTube, so you'll see this, but this is that uh, pr troublesome, uh, I don't know if it's going to show up to you. It's a troublesome sheep that I've been working with with that paper. I like that it doesn't glare, like it actually can see it on the camera, not shiny, and that's nice, but I just, I'm so used to being able to like smear in a big amount of tonal area and then go in and erase out my highlights. And I was getting kind of like a bit of a gumminess as I was going in and erasing. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to deal with that particular product, but now I'm gonna finish, film, finish up that artwork and filming that for all the time lapse this weekend and it will go in my critique club membership group real time narrated so i do my lessons i narrate as i'm going for my longer tutorials so if something does come up that's a problem i might forget when i go back to edit it later so if i'm like oh shoot my electric eraser is all totally gummed up with this stuff it's not working very well i might forget that you always forget the battles like if you like two weeks in the future when you go to edit something you forget the frustration and the battle that you had with that but when you're like working at it to be able to say that real time to somebody like oh if this happens to you it's happening because of this it's not you it's this particular particular this particular medium so i'm gonna finish that up i don't know if i'll get any pottery done today but but i'll definitely get my weekend stuff you make a lot of stuff yeah how many videos do you put out in a week this month because i'm doing a feature called pastel month this month so i'm doing daily this month so i'm doing two pastel videos a week and then my regular features which i do a review on monday i'm doing pastels tuesday th and thursdays i do watercolor on wednesday on friday i do a feature called frugal friday where we make supplies or we like tips to use your supplies in different ways saturday is sat chat and sunday is sketchbook sunday which is usually a time lapse of whatever i'm putting in the my critique club which is a, a membership group I have over at my teachable school where if people want, they want to share their original artwork for feedback, they can upload two original paintings a month. But I also put in two fresh new tutorials every month. So if people don't want to share, they just want some long, more training, do some projects that would be too long for YouTube, too in-depth for YouTube, they can access that plus all the past tutorials from the past four years. So, so yeah, so that's, so, you know, if I'm not doing like, like a feature month where I'm posting on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's generally like four or five videos a week, but this month happens to be seven videos a week. So, Plus, because my kids were going to school and I was like, oh my gosh, my babies, I have twins that just, I graduated high school last year. They are starting their first years in college. So I was just kind of worried that I wouldn't be able to cope with having all three of my children moving out at once. And I would be kind of like just wandering around the house like a ghost. So I'm like, I got to make sure that I've got stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I mean, I feel like <laughs> it's nice to meet somebody who's actually does more, even more than I do. So that's a relief, but uh, because I do, I do a video essay on Monday. I do a written essay on, t no, I do the podcast on Monday. I do written es essay on Tuesday and a video essay on Tuesday. On Thursday, I do this live show called draw with me Friday. I have another essay that comes out. I teach a class also every week on Monday. So there's a lot of stuff going on I, I, and people say, well, how do you do so many things? I don't know about you, but I feel like I need to do a lot of things. I like to do a lot of things. I find that, that that's, that's my art in a way is making a lot of things. And, and, and it can be a challenge when you have to do a thing that you need to do a lot of preparation for and how you figure that out into it. You know, you did this workshop for us while being on that same schedule but you were able to, I imagine, be quite disciplined about when you do it, how you do it. I mean, you seem to be organized and structured in your in your days. Is that is that a key to to, to getting to being so productive? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people have this impression of what an artist does, and they see them like you know prancing through the wildflower field with their watercolors, and you know sitting down and you know painting a picture and having a picnic, and then like you know no, there's like you have to definitely keep a schedule. And also, I find that it's it's really helpful to work ahead because there'll be days where you're not a, having a high energy day, and you just feel like you know being cozy and putting on a movie or a podcast or an audiobook and just drawing and not really producing. Maybe you film it, maybe you don't, maybe you film it to 
to time lapse later. And there's going to be days where you've got tons of energy and tons of time and you can get it all done. And then there'll be days where you have all the time and for whatever reason, you just can't seem to get started. So yeah, I think to be disciplined, be disciplined and work far enough ahead that if you do have a few of those off days, you're not freaking out because you are right down to the last minute of a deadline and, and forced to get something done. But yeah, in the course of a day, you know, you may have times where you have a lot of energy. You may have times where you're tired. You may, you know, if you can shuffle your schedule around enough that you've got like a to-do list where it's like, oh, I've got kind of like a punch list, like a contractor would have a punch list when they're finishing up a house. They'd be like, well, I have to, you know, put trim around this window. I need to, you know, fix those stairs. I need to do this. And they have those and they know how long those tasks take. If you have a punch list like that for your studio being like, oh, I need to, like for one thing, one thing that centers me really well is cleaning up. Sometimes I'll leave a mess in my studio at night because I know that if I, that when I walk into my studio, sometimes it's like, ooh, options, what will I do? And if I see a mess on my table, that's what I'll do first. I'll clean them Mess. And by the time I'm done cleaning it, something will have like interested me enough to get started on that project instead of just walking into a clean studio with all the options open to me in the world and then not being able to decide. But also having a list like, okay, I've got 20 minutes. I can, I can trim a couple pots. I can prime a canvas. I can gesso this. I can, I love using clear gesso on old mat board scraps for colored pencil work because it makes your colored pencils just fly because it takes so much pigment. It works wonderful. So I'm like, oh, I can gesso a bunch of those mat boards or I can press a bunch of pieces of cloth that I need to use for something else. So just, but you, but sometimes it's hard to think of those little tasks when you're, if you don't have them written down. So just having a, like a notepad in your phone where you've got just little check boxes that, Ooh, it's so satisfying to check off that box <laughs> and see that go to the completed section. And, and yeah, so it helps you, it helps you from not wasting time. And definitely you got to be disciplined. I think anybody that wants to go like work for themselves or freelance, really needs to be disciplined because you don't have a boss looking over your shoulder telling you what to do and you need to learn how to work with your own workflow and how to motivate yourself because nobody else is going to do it you're the you're the only person that's going to get you moving absolutely yeah i i heard of this technique that i used which is called well i refer to it as parking at the top of a hill so it's like when you come in in the morning if you're parked at the top of the hill you can start rolling down the hill and then you can get done so if you're writing something which is what I do a lot is not have, have stop mid sentence. Or if you're drawing something, you know, have an obvious place to pick up, you know, so that you don't have to, you don't come into the studio saying, hmm, what should I do? What should I, what should I make art about? That's not what it is. You want the, because working begets working, right? The energy that comes from making stuff makes you do more stuff. But if you're just sitting there and you have a perfect fastidious studio and everything is, is put away, it's much, much harder to, to get moving. So I guess I'm, yeah, I guess I'm just repeating tips. what you said in my own version of doing it, which is, uh, yeah, always have some, and then I also call having stuff set up in advance. I call that procrastination. So that the idea ah. is basically right. So you, so you, I've always been hated deadlines. So I've always done stuff way in advance and I'll start to panic and think oh, it's due such and such a time. And then suddenly I'll realize like I did it much faster than I ever anticipated. So it's done long in advance, you know, so that's procrastination. Yeah. Right. I like that. I like that. I like to be, well, cause you never know when an opportunity is going to come up. So if you lay everything out to the last minute and then some really awesome opportunity comes up, but you can't take it because you've already, you've put off these other things and they need to get done because you've already committed to them. I mean, that's a huge bummer. So, so yeah, I always try to get stuff done timely so that I don't have to say no if something comes up, that's really fun and awesome. And I want to do it. Yeah. I think blank space is how opportunity finds its way to you also. You know, that you need to, you need to make time. If you're, if you're just crammed, you know, for all the time and your calendar is booked up months in advance, it's ch chances are these things won't even come to you, let alone you turning them down. So that's just sort of seems to be the yeah. way it you have, sort of. you have to worry about having too much time though, because if you got all day, then you'll get, I got all day syndrome. And then, then you'll like kind of, you, you have too much. You don't know how to portion it up. I think it was John Cleese. He did this, this speech on creativity and he was talking about how you just need, you need like two hours. You need not quite enough time to get the thing written or get the thing done, but enough time that you can really jump in there and then like really give it your all. So he was saying two hours, that's what you need for creativity. If you have all day, then you're just gonna kind of waste the time rat time away until you have about two hours left and then you're gonna kick it into high gear and uh, get it done and paraphrasing it was been a while since I heard that but it was a really good a good speech from a very prolific uh, artist so right absolutely a comedian writer artist anyway.
Well, good. Well, I think we've used the time admirably. I think seeing as you speak about twice as fast as a normal human, this has actually been like a two, <laughs> two hour podcast. So that's, that's really good. Well, great. I love talking to Lindsay. I hope you enjoyed it too. If you'd like to learn more about her work, visit her channel on YouTube. It's called The Frugal Crafter. And I hope you'll join Lindsay's live workshop, Yummy Color, on October 15th here at Sketchbook School. I'll add information about the workshop and Lindsay's various websites in the show notes and in the description on YouTube. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time with more Art for All.